What, what is a patron? Who is a patron? Well, it's someone that you admire, someone that you look up to, someone who is supportive of the club, someone who is cheap, <laughs> and preferably someone who is local. Um, Somebody who's saved me. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Oh, and beautiful and... Yeah, uh, beautiful, erudite, um, yeah. And the names that came out of the hat straight away. Said no. <laughs> <laughs> Six or seven I'm just going to give up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the new patrons of Banbury Folk Club Marion Fleetwood, Go Jerry you. Colvin, <laughs> and assisted tonight by Linda Webb and Trish Stevens. So, thank you so much, guys. Hey, we're patrons! Oh, yeah. <laughs> the drink's on you! I just want to check something. That, uh, we don't have to give anyone the money, do we? <laughs> yes. Not yet. I'm really joking. Not yet. Welcome to the most innovative club. It was innovative in the past. Sorry to excuse no, a bit. It's fine. But I have to say that it was one of the first clubs, Banbury, that actually gave people like me, I, I, I wore a suit and I remember going to uh, a club in Birmingham, I'm not going to say which club, it was the Red Lion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember this was many years ago in the 1970s and it was a great place and God bless them but someone came up and said, my God, it's a real coup for us because it's the first coloured person who's actually been on stage. And yeah, it's not funny, I know, but you can laugh. The <laughs> thing is though, think folk music has really moved on and this club has been really innovative. It's given people like myself, and like the brilliant Marion Fleetwood and Little Johnny England and the Gigantics and lots of bands that wouldn't generally get gigs because we're rubbish. <laughs> but, but we're cheap. But, but to give people who don't play perhaps traditional music and it's you know thanks to Derek and Mary the past yeah. and thanks to you know the guys at the present and thank you very much for the future because I know that you guys look for really innovative and interesting music to put on so can we have a big hand please for the new uh, committee and everyone involved God bless them all. Yeah. Before I start sounding a bit like Prime Minister's Question Time, um, Any I'd, li I'd, like to, I'd like to introduce you to the second best songwriter in the room. <laughs> I'm joking! I'm joking, I'm joking. No, my absolutely exceptional good friend, and if I wasn't married, I'd marry her. Aww. Please welcome Marion Fleetwood! Thank you very much. I'll give you just a just as brilliant an intro when it's your turn. So, before we, uh, before we started tonight, um, Jerry and I tossed a coin. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to do two songs each and take it in turns. Somebody tell me if I've got pizza in my teeth. <laughs> no, I've got filled pepperoni lurking. You notice that, don't you? When you get old, things get stuck in your teeth more. Well, no, yeah. I would tell you something funny I said to my first husband regarding teeth, but it's very rude. So, so I'll just leave it hanging there. So, so we're going to do two songs each. I'm, I'm going to start off with the one that I, I like starting sets off with because it's a, a Sandy Denny song. I might have to take my glasses off because the writing's big enough. And uh, it's about being a musician. And how we feel when we're up here. Thank you. 
So in the spirit of Kevin being dead brave and doing a song that he'd only just written, I'm going to do a song that I wrote last week when I was very cross in the kitchen. Because that's when we write songs, musicians. Either when we're in love or very cross in the kitchen. Or both. Um, and this, this was... I wasn't cross, actually. I, 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 was, I was watching um, the BBC iPlayer. I don't watch normal television, I only watch the iPlayer. I like to choose what I watch. And I watch EastEnders every night when I get in from a gig really late. And um, my poor next door neighbour has the doof, 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 doof going through her wall at kind of two o'clock in the morning generally. And, um, but I'd watch this documentary about the T-Rex. Did anybody else see it? The, the, one, the one where they rebuilt it and they, they, yeah, did you see it? It was great, wasn't it? I, I wanted to watch a documentary about T-Rex. <laughs> so it was a bit of an accident. Uh, no, I was I was all set for a good music sort of biopic documentary, and I got hit with dinosaurs. It was very strange, but I, but I, I, I persevered. It was very good. It was well worth it. I'm just I've just remembered. I'm in my teaching year. I've come straight from school. Oh, it's weird cardigans. Um and um. And I thought, I was, I was thinking as I was watching it, this is really great. Like, you know, it, all these dinosaurs that are, are fossilised 
Um, imagine if they were kind of looking down from dying own heaven and wondering, you know, wow, we're, we're still so interesting. People still find us really interesting, even though we lived like a gazillion years ago. And then I thought, well, what would it be like if it was the other way around? If dinosaurs were still alive and we'd really cocked up and that extincted ourselves. Which is, let's face it, increasingly, increasingly likely. Instincted ourselves. It's a good word, isn't it? Great. <laughs> Jerry likes a word. <laughs> so, so I thought, okay, so, so here we are all sort of watching a, a documentary about lots of very clever doctors and PhD students and everybody else talking about dinosaurs and what we can learn from them. Um, I'm going to turn the tables, so I'm going to imagine what it would be like to be a dinosaur in a lab coat looking at the remains of a human being in a jar and discussing with his PhD thesis students why we got extincted. So this is called Dr. Dinosaur. <laughs> Might be a bit odd. Oh, I'm just going to do this. <clears throat> because, like I said, Kevin, Kevin, you were dead brave doing a brand new song and everything. I'm crapping myself doing this one. And I've just spent ages writing out words in bigger writing. And I've got pizza all over it. <laughs> <laughs> it's alright, it'll be okay. Right, there's a chorus, of course. The answer is very clear. The answer is right here. up a little bit because it was just very low. <clears throat> I was obviously very cross and I'd been smoking a lot in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, down a bit. This is why I love guitar. Mm -hmm. Two verses, a chorus, two verses, a chorus, two verses, a chorus, a chorus. In the lab on the hill, in a lab coat, a dinosaur stood. In a jar on the shelf, stood samples of rock, glass and wood. which bother us most in our minds. Use the clues on his body which he has left us behind. Guess to the cause. The students 
look worried, not wanting to risk it, they paused. Until one eager candidate, Thomas Rex, lifted his arm. I've read about something, but thought it was all fake alone. In 2019, thousands of years ago, an orange buffoon tweeted something about buttons and go. Then came someone emailed him saying, just test me, go on. So they both pressed their buttons and launched something they called a bomb. Welcome to the stage, my extremely esteemed pal. I've known Jerry for years and years and years, and it's been fabulous so far, and it will continue to be fabulous. Um, he's a remarkable musician. I know, we're going to say it, I'm going to say it. <laughs> um, it's been an honour and a privilege, privilege to play with him for so long, and um, he's also an incredibly dear friend and I love him very, 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 very much and it gives me no greater pleasure um, to share this honour of being your patron with somebody so fabulous. Um, and, uh, so please welcome to the stage, Lyndon Webb. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Colin. <laughs> We just stop patting each other on the back. I know. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, my name is Jerry Colvin, and thank you so much for coming. And uh, uh, as this is an innovative uh, club, 
and always has been, and will do in the will be in the future. I thought uh, Linda was the inspiration for this at the back, um, uh, because she read some poetry at the Christmas do, and I and I never get a chance to read my poetry, and I hope you don't mind. I know it's a bit bizarre, but do you mind if I read a couple of poems that? She, one of them is about 20 minutes, and the other one. <laughs> it's a bit like, you know. Yeah, it's a bit like the prelude. You know, don't you? Well, yeah, it's got you in it. So you're right. Has it got Helen in it? Sorry, it's got everyone in it. Wait, wait until the verse about Derek and Mary, I can tell you now. No, it's funny because. Uh, God bless I can't see anyone. Um, it's funny that uh, Marion should, should do a song about dinosaurs because my good friend Nick, who just lived down the road, he used to have this theory about dinosaurs. You know, they ruled the earth for 265 million years and then they died out allegedly because of an asteroid and then they became a, uh, a band of oil underneath the earth. And then we drilled out the oil and we used some of that oil to make little plastic dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like the freakiest thing? It's, it's like wearing a charity band to save rubber trees. <laughs> I, I, I really like those ironies in the world. And, and this song is about uh, a guy that lived next door to me when I was a kid. And he uh, lived there, he, he'd been there when he was a little boy, and he stayed there until he passed away. And I used to play football in, in the, our garden, in Maxwell Gardens next to him. And I don't know whether anyone else did this, you pretended that your shed was Bobby Charlton. <laughs> For the younger people in the audience, Bobby Charlton was a, uh, <laughs> a centre forward in the 1960s. Oh. Do you remember? Yeah, sorry, all right. <laughs> and also, being, being very Weinstein about it, for the women in the audience, football's a male sport. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen, the only way we've become patrons is because of sexual harassment. <laughs> Sorry, that's terrible, isn't it? It was called 81 Maxwell Gardens, and it's about living in the same house for the, for the entirety of your life, and I hope I can read it, and I hope you like it. I have become the boy next door who forgot to take the bins out. The kid superstar passing to Bobby Charlton's shed flower pot best who buried his goldfish in the gorchard next to the action men killed in action, headless, handless, manipulated but eagle-eyed, aunt kissed, mother smothered with a Christmas pillowcase. I have become the teenager next door, all Oxford bagged, velvet jacked, centre for forward parting, Alan Clark shirt holding, fonds fresh and glitter balled, First shag, first car, first fag, consulate. I have become... Actually, it's, a, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a bit of a pun, but that doesn't matter. Shouldn't have done that, really, because Stephen Fry would beat me up. I have, I have become the office boy next door. Photocopied hand, face, arse. Toner smelling, three-piece sweet, three-piece suit, three-piece Bernie meal. Big match, see a Saturday wrestle, girl fumble, Marlow room, slow dance shuffle, late bus desperation, Deptford brawl. I've become the married couple next door, people carrier, tut tutting, theatre like the dentist, piles, three piece kids not going out in that, fat, what time do you call this, pissed on wine, on tax, sucked and stitched. Let the cat out, let your pants out. I have become the old man next door. Shuffling, shove, half penny, pinching, window, widow. See you soon, Dad, busy at work, bloody liar. Loose women, place in the sun, away or home, alone. You've got the garden, I'd rather have cocaine. <laughs> rather have my old hip, rather be the boy next door that I hear playing football. I want to scream, but I croak, be quiet. He doesn't hear, they never do. As the kid superstar 
passes to shed Ronaldo flower pot bail house for sale. Aww. Very kind. You're, you're very, very, very kind. And I, 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 I like pretending I'm mentally ill because people like you then. <laughs> Well, except for the Tory party, obviously. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? They don't like the mentally ill, they just want them to go away. A bit like Hitler. Anyway, uh, one last... Sorry, I don't mean to be contentious, and please don't let me... Don't let this put you off coming to this wonderful folk club. Because the bloke's just sacked me as patron of the <laughs> I'd just like to read, before I invite the fabulous Marion Fleetwood back to do another song, and Dizia, we're on next after her, all right? Um, the, um, I'd like to read you, do you mind if I read you another thing? It's only short. Yeah, it's uh, Winston Churchill's speech from 1941. No, it's not, no. It's about my mate who retired, his name is Patrick Melody, he lived on the Harmony Estate, I don't know, it was a song I wrote many, many years ago. And, uh, and, and, and it was him, he retired um, from the police. And he'd spent all his life working for his family and his uh, job, and he really liked it. And there's no, there's no, there's nothing bad about that. That's good, isn't it? And he, all he wanted when he retired was to have a long lie in. He said to me, I haven't lie, lay in bed on a Sunday for 40 years, and I'm going to do it. And I wrote this little thing. I hope you like it. Yeah, I well, well, actually, I don't hope you like it. I don't, I didn't care really. <laughs> Actually, Knight Knightley told me to say that to the audience. It's called the long lion. This was his time. He deserved it. He'd earned it. After years of working his fingers to the bone, he was now able to have what he'd been looking forward to for an age. A long lion. He lay on his back, lost in the moment. His bed had never felt more comfortable and was the perfect temperature. His pillow was plumped to perfection. The room was serene and peaceful and for the first time in a long time, he had nothing to think about except his future. Oh, he didn't begrudge the compromises, the sacrifices he'd made marriage, kids, work, but now, now finally, he could do what he wanted to. He thought about all the things he'd put off, postponed, that book he was going to write, the language he was going to learn, the piano lessons, the travelling he was going to do, the adventures that were never possible until now. But not yet, he was going to have that well-deserved long lying first. He heard the murmuring and shuffling about downstairs, but wasn't moved to get up. They could look after themselves from now on. This was his, not their time. Finally, reluctantly though he was to get up from his long lying, he decided to start his new beginning. It was going to be wonderful. He sat up and banged his head on the coffin lid. <laughs> Time, do we have to stop? <coughs> Please welcome to the stage. Oh, are you going to come oh, on? No, now? You didn't, I don't know. I thought you, that was your Can you do, we'll do a really quick song and then you're on? No, 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 no. Do you want to go? Please welcome to the stage the fabulous Lyndon Webb and the wonderful Trish Power. It's a really quick song. <laughs> Well, that was only t 
two minutes, wasn't it? <laughs> anyway, she went on for ages. I know! <laughs> <laughs> I know you should. <laughs> Lyndon Webb, ladies and gentlemen, is, is the third best guitarist in the room. <laughs> I'm joking, mate. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's funny how everyone laughs at Marion's jokes. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. This song is all about fate, and I wondered what sort of uh, car fate drove, and it's, uh, it features on a lovely album which is called um, uh, Back and Forth. I hope you like it. I suppose I've got to tune up in a minute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Anyone believe in fate? Yeah. Karma? I believe in karma, don't you? I wonder if it's true. Do you think of that? I'd really like to think that there was some sort of fatal karma, wouldn't you? I think I think we kind of can change things. But you're right, love. <laughs> Have you found it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this song Trish doesn't even know. <laughs> Go for it, mate. I wrote it for the Beatles, but unfortunately they've already bloody split up. <laughs> Somewhere in a cupboard, in the corner of your eye, there is a shelf where they all sit, all immortalised. And in that place you see them, Exactly as they were And they'll always be a part of who you are As you see it in the back seat of fate's fast car I got this verse the First love and the last love And the couple in between the friends and foes and so and so's of that dark family They wake you up in the dead of night And lie in well eyes burning bright And they'll always be a part of where you are As you see it in the back seat The fake's fast car No use complaining about your parking lot. <laughs> the only things in life you can be sure of is that the sea is high, the sky floats, and you can run, and you can run, but fate sat at the road you own. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Hitch that ride. It's neither up or neither down. It's horizontal lines. Emperor fate controls the way. Weather, smile, or frown. And they'll always be a part of who you are. A fate's fast car As you see it in the back seat A fate's fast car Thank you.
Okay. Right. Oh, uh, Brian then. There. Okay, Mr. Richard. It's going to have lots and lots of reverb on this week. It's going to sound really spooky. See, there's something really odd. sensitive to temperature change. That has been in my car for the last week and a half. <laughs> it's generally mistreated. <laughs> right, lose reverb. No 
shoes more he no had no hat no gifts or pearls or gold I cannot give you pearls my queen or emeralds of finest hue but if like me you like a pine I've something here for you you can keep your emeralds pearls and gold and your winds of red and green and you won't sleep with the red love ready to breast cancer for about five years, four or five years, um, very, very bravely, um, and had horrendous chemotherapy, and every, every, every treatment they could throw at her, they did, because she was only 57 when she died. <coughs> and, uh, but she was the most fantastic woman, she was just so much fun, she was brilliant, and if it's possible to, to die well, she did. She absolutely went for it in the last couple of years of her life, and she, she, she raged against it and fought it and laughed and you know, she was just fabulous. Um, she didn't go down glumly, shall we say. She spent her last two years pissed on Prosecco <laughs> and eating nothing but party food because she couldn't be bothered to cook. <laughs> she said, if you've only got two years left, you may as well eat party food. So she, she just ate, ate volivons. <laughs> I remember those, those uh, mixed quiches, you know, the little tiny ones from Marks and Spencer's, and the coconut breaded prawns. She really liked those. But her favourite were the Volivons, the 12 pack of Volivons with the four of three different kinds. So you've got like the chickeny one, and the tunery one, and then whatever, chicken tiki kind of, whatever the other one was. Um, but she would come round to my house with a plate of party food, ready cooked, and um, a bottle of Prosecco and 20 Benson and Hedges. And, um, and she'd knock on the door and she'd already be plastered and, and she'd say, would you like a drink, Marion, dear? Would you like a drink? And, uh, and so we'd sit in my kitchen, drinking Prosecco, eating party food and smoking Benson and Hedges and laughing, just laughing constantly about the absurdity of life and the world and the universe and everything else. Um, 
but she had two wigs that were made for her by the Trevor Sorby Foundation. Um, and one was a blonde bombshell. She had kind of short, black, curly hair. And she, she'd always wanted to have a blonde bob, bombshell wig. Um, and so she had one of those, that was her party wig. And she came round one day. And um, have you all seen, have anybody seen the film Something About Mary? You know that bit, the famous bit, yeah? She, she came round to the door. And, uh, and, and with her party food and Prosecco and everything else. <laughs> and I said, um, Sue, have you seen your hair? I come into the kitchen and have a look in the mirror. So she came into the kitchen and what had happened was, you know when you open your, a, a fan oven, you get that blast, right? Which, which explains why my glasses are a bit wonky because they melted a little bit once when I did that. But Sue's hair had melted and set in this like V, like this. And because she was just full of chemotherapy, she had no sense of smell or anything, so she had no idea that she'd just melted her hair. And, um, and she was also drunk. So, so, so she went back home and said, I'll just go home and change my hair then. So she toddled around and, and changed her hair and came back around in the black, in the black bob. Um, but I was, with, I was lucky enough to be with her when she died. And um, I know that sounds weird, doesn't it? But I, was, I felt I kept myself very lucky that I was there with her. And um, I was holding one hand and her sister was holding the other hand and we were rubbing rose-scented hand lotion into her hands. So um, I can't see party food or Prosecco or smell roses without thinking of my friend Sue. So this is, we've all lost people, haven't we? And I didn't know her when she was younger. But I always wondered what she would have been like love to have known her. Because she would have danced. I just know she would have danced. So this is called Dancing Girl. Yeah. 
read the telegraph each day, but only the obituaries on the back page in rows they lay. Writers, poets, politicians, all gone. He read the obituaries and then became one. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about people when they read the poetry, they turn into Richard Burton, don't they? They have to read it. I'm always fascinated by the fact that that lyrics stick in your head, but poetry you have to read from a page because it makes you look like Dylan Thomas. He was complete and utter twat. But <laughs> Isn't it funny how you, you vilify and love those people? I love Dylan Thomas, he's one of my favourites, but God, what an idiot he was. And that's why I relate to him. <laughs> oh God, what are we doing? Um, oh, we're doing a song about the pub. We've got to hurry up now, haven't we? Yeah? This features the most fantastic accordion from Trish, really average singing, <laughs> and uh, it's for anyone who loves the pub. Yeah? Yeah. I, I was very ill a couple of years ago and the pub saved me. I used to go in the afternoon and sit with a bunch of Nazis and, uh, no, no I, I don't mean I wasn't a Nazi, I mean, and, you know, people would say, oh, you know, <coughs> complain about the world and what was wrong with it, and, you know, say, oh, immigration is ruining the country, and then turn to the Asian landlord and go, what are you, Sunil, obviously? <laughs> and his Hungarian wife, oh, not you, Catalan, <laughs> no, you're all right, it's all the other ones that come and steal our jobs and steal our women. And I'd always say, yeah, but they're really gorgeous looking, aren't they? <laughs> Asian men. <laughs> really upset the farmer who couldn't. Just, sorry, we've got to get on with it, sorry. <laughs> that's when I decided I was going to postpone my rehab until tomorrow. Oh, do you know this song? Yeah. We don't have to do it. <laughs> Let's do another one. <laughs> If you know this one, don't sing along because we're the stars tonight. <laughs> How long is she going to the loo? She said, can you just talk until I get... Oh, you're at the bar! Brilliant. Go for it. Sorry. I'm postponing my rehab till tomorrow. I consider it the best course for me. Today I'll spend with a few passing friends in a place we call debauchery. I love that part. You'll always find me in the same spot. The bar 
a stool with the wobbly leg. Optic mystically staring at a half empty glass. What a fine way for happy hours to pass. Cause I'm postponing my rehab till tomorrow. It's a plan and it's working for me. It's a circle of holes on the nicotine walls where the dartboard used to be. Ain't that the truth? Sometimes I feel just like that board. Sometimes with the holes I have affinity. So I turn down the sound on the widescreen TV Fold my crisp packet meticulously Then I line up them beer mats like a cemetery Never understood why that's important to me Till I postpone my rehab till tomorrow it's a plan I've worked out perfectly. Love this bit. Then caught in our own drink like a fishbowl. Reaching new heights in our all time low. The bell never rings in this watering hole. Yesterday, today was tomorrow. That's how times go. Cause postponing my rehab's one thing on the list Of things I will do the day after this The peanut girls out Virgin Mary. With each purchase, she miraculously appears. It's the topic of talk most every day. I buy the last snack, cause I'm not coming back. Cause I postpone my rehab for 24 hours. It's a plan. Oh, it sounds good to me. So buy me a beer, cause tomorrow I'm not here. It's a plan. Always oh, it sounds good to me.